not mistaken. She'll want this back when she wakes up. But for now, I think I'll hold on to it. I know, I'll post an entry myself so that when she wakes up, she'll get to hear it. Hello, Paige's Audio Diary. My name is Hattie, Hattie Wells. I know this isn't what you're used to, but you'll have to learn to deal with it for a little. Miss Paige is in, well, in quite the situation at the moment. I get the sense it's not the first time she's been in a situation, huh? Oh, and Paige, if you're listening to this, I won't go through your entries. I promise! I guess this will be my way of opening up to Miss Paige, since I haven't really had the chance yet. The only time I've spent with Paige is when I took her to buy a dress. Oh, what a lovely thing she is! Ah, but before we get into anything about me, I should probably tell you what happened. Miss Paige's quarters was hit with a cannon! Yup, I ain't selling you a dog on that one! Luckily, the Royal Grace is no dainty gal. She took it pretty well. Paige wasn't hurt severely, but she's knocked out cold. The Royal Grace is pretty banged up too, but after a few moments more into battle, Captain Alex told me it was time to retreat. We're a brave bunch of pirates, but we ain't no numpties. We know when bravery turns into foolishness. Since the darlings weren't hitting us with another airship, I was able to get us out of there without any more damage. Well, after we were out of range, that is. Although that doesn't mean that the darlings aren't after us, I wouldn't be surprised if they were on our hides as we speak. The crew is on high alert and our nurse has her hands full with those injured during the battle. All I hope for is that we destroyed the darlings' experiments. What was there? Well, it wasn't good. You know, thinking back on it, well, I feel guilty. I shouldn't do this, but listen, Paige, I don't know if you'd go back over your entries, so I don't know if you'll ever hear this, but I think I should tell you some very personal things. Things that could help you and possibly Mr. Edgar as well. This crew is a pirate crew for a reason, a band of people who need each other. But don't be mistaken, we may seem like a family, but that is not in the slightest what we are. And I know that's what you're looking for, but you won't find that here. And certainly not as long as your friend Edgar is around. I'm sorry to say, Mr. Edgar seems like a nice fellow, but as long as he has the last name Cadwell, I highly doubt things will look good for him in the future while he stays on the ship. The ship I happen to fly. Er, well, at the moment Clint is taking over for me. But that's not the point. We aren't bad people, Paige. We're damaged. We're injured people who band together for a very long time now. And last night, well, that wasn't a coincidence. We've been given false information time and time again. We've been trying so hard to find out something on the aristocrats. We were going to go to the Darling sooner, but then we received your call. Everyone on board almost thought themselves crazy when Captain Alex told us to turn the ship around and go save your sorry hides. But I have a feeling they knew something had to be up. When we saw the carnage in Grand Iverglen, I think they knew right away that this was the work of the aristocrats. I think they knew your friend was one of them from the get-go. I think a lot of us knew. But you can never judge a bloke by his trousers, you know? So we let you on board. But the crew still didn't understand Alex's plan. You're lucky this crew put so much faith in Captain Strandwood, or else I would have expected a mutiny to occur. But Captain Alex had had this plan all along. You and Edgar are just a happy addition. And I didn't want to tell you this because I love Captain Alex with the heart of a child. But I feel that you and the lad have to get out of here. And now, for your own safety, because I don't know what is going to happen at the end of this whole convoluted scheme. You know, I am truly embarrassed for how I acted last night. I thought myself stronger. But I guess when you're staring at your past, you tend to feel your old skin grow back. Miss Page, you asked about my leg at the ball, remember? Who made it? Well, let me tell you why I'm part automaton and not a fancy cyborg like some of those over in the Capella system. My leg is not all that's missing, my dear. I'm missing many of my internal organs as well. But those are not the things you can replace with nuts and bolts and a bit of steam, unlike what the aristocrats like to do. Those are things that I cannot ever get back. Not really. I could tell by your dress when we first found you that you probably lived in the utter pits of Grand Iverglen. Not on the streets, but probably struggling to make ends meet. <laughs> Am I close? Or maybe that's not your story. I can't tell with you. You're such a giggle mug that I can't tell what your past is. But I can tell you mine, as cheerful and giddy as I may be at times, I was a lot like you. I lived in Sphinx, actually. I was born and forgotten there. Raised is a word you use for someone who had an upbringing. 
I was not given that luxury. I was very young when the men with masks came. They came for me in the night while I was sleeping in one of the alleys, starving and recovering from the heat of that day. Their masks were long and pointed, like that of a bird's skull. I never did see their eyes. After that night, I did not see another human's eyes directly for five years. Well, that's not true. The only eyes I saw while in their care were the eyes of tortured souls. You see, I was an experiment, much like the ones you saw in the darling's basement downstairs. I can't say what the men in mask wanted with me, what sort of experiments they were running. I can only tell you I was there for the rest of my childhood. But when I was 16, something happened. I was tied to a table, and two new men came rushing. I could tell that they were not like the others. They were panting and out of breath. The men in masks did not show emotion. I often wondered if they felt nothing, much like I did at the time. These men wore the same mask, the same clothing, but I could tell they were not the same. They saw me, restrained on the cold slab, and rushed over. The one man hissed at the other that he was enraged, that he had to leave his home to help with this mission. But when he looked at me, he sighed and pulled off his mask. I guess it's worth it. We got what we came for, and maybe we can save another child, he said. He had a kind smile. I was so tired. I could barely keep my eyes open. But I could hear them so clearly. By this point, the men in mass had taken my organs for whatever it was they used them for. I remember the first man, who still had his mask on, saying that it was their responsibility, that they started this and they needed to finish it no matter the cost. The second man picked me up and told me everything was going to be alright. I told him I was going to die, and he told me that was not the case. I blacked out. And when I awoke, I was in a strange room, my insides burning. There were two elderly gentlemen there, the one who carried me out, and the other I seemed to be the first man I saw. The one who carried me smiled and told me not to move. He told me that they had helped develop a system for me in place of my organs. That's the part of me I can't tell you about. Not because I don't want to, or because I made some pact with the old gods, but because I don't know what the two of them did. All I know is that I'm alive because of them. That I don't have to take anything or do anything to help my body. That it feels... normal. But there was a price to pay. The second man told me that I had an infection. The men in masks would poke and prod me everywhere. It just so happened that the infection was in my leg, and that's why they had to amputate it. I was upset at first, but I realized that I was alive. The second man showed me a beautiful brass leg. He said that it was specifically made for me, and that no matter where I went, people would know the craftsmanship and be able to help me adjust it, should I need to. I wasn't sure what that meant at the time, but that's only because I was never quite good at remembering famous engineers and doctors. You know, now that I think about it, my leg reminds me an awful lot of your wings, Miss Page. Perhaps you'll be just as good as an inventor as this man was. I guarantee I'm happy with what he made for me. Well, I'm sure everyone is. You wanted to know who made my leg, Miss Page. The Arnold Hopkinson. I'm sure you've heard of him. He's a famous engineer. He's gone beyond that, though. He's been a key component to some of the greatest advances in science that we know today. He specialized in steam technology, but worked alongside others in different fields as well. We have more than just engineering to thank him for. When I met Captain Alex and told them who designed my leg, they told me I was crazy. No one had seen Mr. Hopkinson for years. There was some sort of tragedy in the Capella system, and he disappeared shortly after. But I swear it was him. I've seen a photo of him since, and I know that was the man. After he healed me, he and his partner took me to Cecilia, where I first met Captain Strandwood. It was the very same day, as a matter of fact. Alex saw my leg, and just as I did with Grand Aberglen, I feel that they knew that a certain group had done this to me. They asked me if I wanted to join their crew and learn how to fly, so I agreed. I've been here for four years now. 
Arnold Hopkinson saved my life, and Captain Alex Shanwood gave me a reason to live, Miss Page. And I've been trying to prove myself worthy on this crew every day since I joined. But I have to be disloyal for once. For your safety, Miss Page. Alex wants to use Mr. Edgar in order to defeat the aristocrat families. But after that, they want to end the bloodline of the Cadwells. Or any aristocrat, really. You should take my warning. Because I think Alex knows you'll put up a fight if Edgar's in danger. If that happens, they might... My dear Hattie, what are you doing? Nothing, Captain! Is that Miss Page's audio diary? Yes, it is! I was just making sure it still worked. It was a bit banged up after all that. Hattie, delete whatever entry you put into that piece of machinery. Whatever do you mean? My dear Hattie, if you do not, your next beloved will find herself in a terrible accident. Or perhaps your beloved leg. Now, now, Captain, I would never. Oh, I'll delete it right away. This episode of Bosch and Brave was written and produced by Ashley Glenn. Hattie Wells was voiced by Becca Davila, and Captain Alex Stranwood was voiced by me, Adam Barba. Like what we do here? You can follow us on Tumblr, Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, and iTunes. Want to tell us how awesome we are? Send us a message at blackmoreproductions at gmail.com. We hope you guys enjoyed this episode. A lot of time, effort, and love go into these, and we hope you check out the various things we do here at BMP. Blackmore Productions. Swim against the current. <laughs>